Thank you very much, uh, Mariana Rael, and thank you very much, of course, to all colleagues in, in, the, in the panel and uh, to the GQAL campaign for their very kind invitation to join you. I'm, I'm an imperfect replacement for the chair of the Coordination Committee of uh, Special Procedure, Dr. Tlaling Mofoking, who, as you know, is uh, the current Special Rapporteur on the highest attainable level of health, uh, physical and mental, and who is our uh, chair at the moment. Um, and I will be delighted to share with you some perceptions from the point of view of a mandate holder. For those of you watching, you are kind of receiving a succession of views, beginning, of course, uh, with Ambassador Villegas, the chair of the Human Rights Council, the head uh, of the body that takes decisions in relation to uh, the confirmation of uh, these bodies and these special procedures, and then Milena Costa, who was uh, describing the way that this excellent study was carried out. And I join my voice of thanks to, uh, for, for this excellent study that I read with great interest. And it just, it, it encapsulates in such a clear way the reasons of substance and of procedures and of outlook, why this actually matters and it matters a great deal. And I also would like to say that um, Ambassador Villegas was giving some examples as to the decisions that he uh, is called to take in relation to this. And I would like to salute those decisions because I actually think that they have been visionary in the way uh, to acknowledge how this is a factor. Now, from my perspective and having been the chair of uh, the Coordination Committee of Special Procedures during the last year and a member for three years now, there's a number of issues that become very apparent from the way in which we work. And I'd like to bring that perspective into the fold that moves from the procedural and the principled into the pragmatic and the outcomes that are created by special procedures. So the report that we are talking about uh, issued of course um, by this uh, advisory committee makes uh, a number of descriptions that are we could say the foundational platform on why this is substantially important in relation to the coherence of the work of the United Nations. And I think the choice of understanding the impact on equality and non-discrimination, the effectiveness of uh, the work of bodies and mechanisms and the range of perspectives give us the um, point of departure for what I think is a fundamental way to understand the value of diversity and in particular gender parity in the work of special procedures. And that is the reception over, I would say the last six years of feminist thinking as one of the key areas for development in the work of special procedures. Um, and of course, I'm referring uh, to, to intersectional approaches, for example, and gender-based frameworks in the work of special procedures. I am one of the very lucky mandate holders that has in his, the resolution creating my mandate, I'm actually requested to work on the basis of intersectionality and intersectional approaches. And I think that this is the legacy of the visionary work of feminists that have been enriching the work of special procedures and bringing intersectional approaches to the very theories that understand how violence and discrimination, extreme forms of uh, human rights violations and concerns need to be provided with the nuance of this type of frameworks along with gender-based frameworks. And this is what I'd like to bring as my first point. I recognize, and as a long member of the GQL campaign and enthusiast supported of your work, I hope that you know that this is sincere. I recognize the value of gender parity in and of itself because of the reasons outlined by the advisory committee. But in practice, I also think it works as a transformative uh, force for shedding light into the multiple and intersecting ways in which experiences of discrimination happen and happen to people around the world. As a feminist from Sub-Saharan Africa said on my second day on the job, she said, we don't just have one way to identify ourselves. Experiences of violence and discrimination are the result of multiple intersecting 
uh, dimensions. And of course, gender parity is the key to unfold the multiplicity and the nuanced understanding of how discrimination uh, actually happens and is perpetrated upon uh, people all around the world. And um, one of the things that I think at some point somebody doing a, a PhD study, it will not be me, is going to actually be tracking down how this legacy, this conceptual legacy has unfolded on special procedures. I've had the privilege of working with a number of this thinking throughout the years. And uh, I have the specific examples on the energy that generated our input on the draft convention on crimes against humanity, for example, our recent input to the office of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, all of these instruments gather the way in which feminist thinking has actually propelled the way in which special procedures understand analysis of violence and discrimination into a completely different uh, era. Something that I think, uh, Maria Noel, since you were so kindly mentioning my work with the commission and the court, I think is the type of influence that feminist thinking had also in uh, the composition of the court, uh, I would say in the last 20 years. So clearly, when you put together the evidence of how these contributions have reshaped the way in which these bodies interpret human rights law, with the theory that already was signaled in this report by the advisory committee in relation to the impact on range of issues and perspectives considered by United Nations bodies and the effectiveness of the work. You have there all of the scientific evidence that you need to, I think, prove the reasons why, if this were not completely self-evident because of reasons of non-discrimination, it becomes uh, the proof of these uh, elements being identified already by uh, the advisory committee in this rich report. I'd like to also mention that I think an element that we're more and more seeing and that I think it's, it's quite welcome is this idea that parity is not static in relation to time. We also need to see it in a composite analysis of the way mandates have been held throughout time. And I think the example that was given of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Torture is a particularly telling example uh, of which without undermining the excellence uh, and the dedication of previous mandate holders, there was clearly an asymmetry that manifested itself through time and which perhaps is difficult to judge in mandates that are unipersonal. Um, I actually was quite uh, provoked uh, when he was mentioned that the, the special rapporteur, uh, the independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity out of two mandate holders, it has been two men. And I just realized that that was the case. So uh, interested to see how that is going to unfold in the future. So time brings an analysis in relation to that. And as I think Milena was making reference, it is true that at the moment we have a complete parity in relation to special procedures, but it is also true that if you analyze that disaggregating in different type of mandates, or you analyze it in relation to time, the picture that unfolds presents a very different nuance. As does, and this is what my third point is going to be, as does the granularity when you analyze the ways in which mandate holders have a profile that responds, I believe, to the particular circumstances that are made necessary because of the conditions under which we exercise our work. And this is a point that I wanted to, to mention because I think that this is one of the great outcomes of gender parity is that you begin to see granularity in other dimensions. I am very concerned about the way in which the disproportionate burdens in which life is structured uh, all around the globe actually imposes uh, duties uh, and burdens on women in a way that I'm not really sure we can continue to rely on that gender parity that we have uh, at the moment on special procedures. I'll share with you that when COVID-19 hit, one of the most uh, difficult areas for us to deal with was the enormous burden that was being faced in particular by our colleagues uh, female uh, special uh, rapporteurs and independent experts and members of working groups. 
We carried out a diagnostic at the time after six months of COVID, and it blew across the board that our colleagues were facing disproportionate burden as caregivers of their children. They were facing disproportionate burdens as caregivers for elder family members, and they were the ones most impacted by uh, uh, disparities in access to financial stability. And this actually represented a significant finding of the internal survey that we carried out and in which we worked with the Office of the High Commissioner to try and uh, uh, bring some balance into some of those aspects. And I think that this actually uh, reflected that even though we have achieved this milestone, as Milena was saying, we need to ensure that regression is not present. Um, and I am very concerned that under current circumstances of continued uh, COVID-19 um, impact all around the world, uh, it's something that we may not be able to rely on, including when it comes to women presenting themselves as candidates for these positions, given that uh, financial precariousness has become a real part of the picture for many of them. And um, for us, it was, I won't say that it was surprising, but it was actually surprising to what extent our uh, colleagues um, or our women colleagues in special procedures were uh, bearing the blunt of uh, the impact of COVID. I'll finish here uh, just by quickly mentioning that one of the things that I have found, and I know many of my colleagues have found extremely useful in relation to these issues, is the type of mechanisms that in a very concrete way, campaigns such as Equal have given us to actually remind ourselves and others about the importance of these issues. So for example, I remember that a few years ago, I signed a plea not to participate in any panels that would, not, uh, that would only be composed of uh, men. Uh, the, the infamously called manals, uh, which actually has have made me refuse uh, at least five events a year in the last few years, uh, hopefully creating some awareness. And uh, also many of my colleagues and I have in our terms of reference for participation in events that uh, gender uh, representation and the ideal of gender parity needs to be present uh, in the events that we participate in. Um, so hopefully this type of very pragmatic approaches, which I also know were part of the recommendations of the advisory committee, are things in which we can continue to rely so that we can actually uh, take them forward. Uh, as always, thank you uh, and congratulations for your excellent work and very much looking forward to the continued discussion.